Awesome. Thank you, Sonia. It's a pleasure to follow you. Well, well done. Listening carefully to everything you say, and it's unusual. I agree with everything. So well, well done. And I think this will be a, a very useful uh, follow-up, and it'll expand on some of the concepts that you've brought forward. I'd like to cover two broad aspects. One is, is those of you who know me know that I'm not a specialist in assisted reproduction. I'm a maternal fetal medicine specialist. Uh, so I want to approach this on what are the ethical dimensions of those of us who are not specialists in assisted reproduction? What are our ethical obligations? And I want to start by just a, a broad-based background, expand on some of the concepts that Professor Kupasik introduced us to, and then I'll address the specific question of how we in obstetrics and gynecology who are not specialized in assisted reproduction should behave. We all know about morality, which is right and wrong behavior, good and bad character, Bioethics is the discipline study of morality that affects physicians, patients, healthcare organizations, and healthcare policy. As Sonia introduced us to, it affects everything we do today in modern obstetrics, gynecology, and reproductive medicine. What is so important, it's not just science that governs clinical practice, it's ethics, and we need both. Otherwise, we're going to have clinical disaster. Now, here's the rub. If there are disagreements in science, data sets are presented, and statistical analysis. Ethics is based by argument, and we've written extensively what good arguments are. Ethics is not the law. Sure, we live in democracies, and we obey the law. I see some fellow Americans here. The American cancer is the malpractice crisis. When I lecture in the United States, I make it clear it's unethical to do a cesarean delivery. Forgive me if I use obstetrical examples. I'm an obstetrician. Uh, a cesarean delivery, let's say for a breach presentation, because you do not want to get sued by a lawyer. It's very ethical to do a cesarean delivery for a breach presentation if it's better for the fetal patient. Where something becomes unethical, if you deviate from our prime directive to put the patient first. And I don't want to play games with you. As the chairman of a department, I'm involved in many, many risk reduction strategies, which are ethical. There's no problem. Ethics is not necessarily based on religious belief. Please, our international societies, this wonderful academy, pertains to all religions or absence of religions. We need secular ethical principles that apply to all of us. And Sonia introduced us to one core ethical principle, primum non nocere, or first do no harm. My partner for many years, Larry McCullough, taught me this ancient dogma is really a Latin misinterpretation from the Greek. What Hippocrates was all about was not first to do no harm. Otherwise, we'd do nothing in OBGYN or reproductive medicine. It's at least to do no harm. That's what Hippocrates said and is much better captured by the ethical principle of beneficence, which simply means to do good for the patient. No benediction to do good for the patient. It was Percival who first introduced this concept. Sir William Osler from Canada said it so well. The art of medicine lies in balancing probabilities. And as Sonia said so eloquently, the days of the anecdote are done unless there's good evidence, and we need to base our judgments on evidence when it's available. The counterbalance to beneficence or professional judgment is respect for the woman's autonomy. And very simply, how we implement this is the informed consent process, which means the physician discloses information, the patient understands information, and a voluntary decision is made by the patient. 
Another classic ethical principle, one that I know Azam, Sanya, myself, and everyone else in this room is globalists are involved with is justice that deals with fairness, and we have the obligation to put women and children first. Forgive me, it's early in the morning, but a Latin term that's so important, prima facie. That means we balance these different principles in different circumstances. Now, I want to develop this concept of medicine as a profession. Sonia introduced us to this. And it, this was not Hippocrates. Hippocrates is the father of medicine. But for many centuries, medicine was a guild. It was John Gregory from Great Britain who formulated the concept of professionalism. And you realize what went on in 18th century Great Britain. There was a fierce competition among a wide variety of practitioners. There were surgeons, apothecaries, midwives, quacks, and all people cared about was making money. And we hope that is not what it deteriorates today. Gregory had radical concept. The physician should be scientifically and clinically competent, Protect and promote the health-related interests of the patient is the primary concern. The patient comes first. Thomas Percival was his contemporary, and he spoke about organizational professionalism, something that those of us who work in academic centers know about so well. He was the first to define rationing, something that we all have to deal with today. These great pioneers in professionalism said that the doctor needs to be scientifically, ethically, and clinically competent, protect and promote the health-related interests of the patients first. It's fine for doctors to make money. And please, I, I argue that doctors should make above average salaries given the years of training that we go through, the hours we work, and the level of intensity we work. But the patient must come first. And preserve medicine is a public trust. And I'm going to develop this concept. But before I do, I put this picture forward from the time of John Gregory as the ideal obstetrician. And I argue this has relevance today in 2017. On the one side in the blue, you see the science. There were no cesarean sections back then. The technologic advance was the forceps, and that's what made an obstetrician a great scientist. Melded with the virtue of the midwife, the compassion, and I would argue today more than ever, this is what makes the ideal obstetrician, gynecologist, reproductive medicine specialist. We've argued for the professional responsibility model arguing for professional obligations, not just rights. And we have obligations to the pregnant fetal patient. These are not separate patients. And we have obligations to both of them that all must be considered. We've pioneered concepts of autonomy-enhancing strategies. For example, this is a battle that Azam and I fought years ago, all women should have access to second trimester ultrasound. Indeed, women should have access to invasive testing. And the United States was way behind Europe with having first trimester risk assessment. And I want to emphasize the difference between professional judgment and paternalism. This often gets mixed up. Professional judgment is a justified claim of intellectual superiority of evidence-based reasoning over reasoning about scientific and clinical matters and is not necessarily pejorative. Too much, and I think the pendulum has shifted too much toward non-directive counseling or shared decision-making. I criticize my young doctors, my residents, when they present to me a case and say there was acute fetal distress and we offered a cesarean delivery. No, you recommended a cesarean delivery. It's not an ethical mistake to give a clear recommendation when the evidence is clear. I hope if I go into the emergency room with 
an acute appendicitis, the surgeon is going to say we need to operate. The stronger the evidence, the clearer you give a recommendation. This is not shared decision making. You give a clear recommendation. I recently did my taxes. I want a competent accountant who's going to say, Frank, you need to do this. This is not paternalistic. You go to someone who's competent to give you clear advice. When I had trouble with an insurance company, I went to a lawyer who gives me clear advice. So please, the pendulum has shifted too far in one direction. Just because you give clear recommendations doesn't mean you're paternalistic, an important concept. Okay, there's so much more I could say about this, but I know Ozma is a tough taskmaster and we have to stay on time. Let me, with this brief background, discuss the topic at hand, reproductive medicine. How should I behave? And as I look around the room, some of you are not reproductive medicine specialists. How should we behave? And I want to go back to what Gregory and Percival taught us, three guiding principles. The physician should be competent, become and remain scientifically and ethically competent. Two, manage self-interest. Put the patient's interest first. And three, maintain the public trust. These were guiding principles. These are not my guiding principles. Please, I believe them and advocate them. They come to us from John Gregory and Thomas Percival in 18th century Great Britain. Let's talk about competence first. Every OBGYN has an ethical obligation to assure that each patient receives evidence-based clinical management of her condition. By that, the OBGYN directly, and when he or she is to provide what is needed. You refer when you're not competent, and there needs to be honest assessment of this. Assisted reproduction medicine is a multidisciplinary specialty. The general OBGYN is not clinically competent to provide these services, so there needs to be referral in this area. The competence component creates the professional responsibility to refer to the assisted reproductive medicine specialist. The specialist needs to provide evidence-based care, comprehensive collects, analyzes, and reports, take-home baby rates, not pregnancy rates, take-home baby rates. And at least in America, there's been some dirty dealing, conflation of these two issues. Provides a thorough, informed consent and is transparent what all the financial cost is. In the United States, most IVF is not paid for by insurance or the government. This is an out-of-pocket expense and some places are not so ethical with this information. The specialist must be available for consultation for the clinical management of complications. The specialist can't wash his or her hands once the pregnancy results. He or she needs to be available if a complication arises. I know I'm going quickly, but we'll leave time for discussion. Sonia introduced us to the topic of self-interest. You should prepare the patient with questions that she should ask. Success rates, and I can't emphasize enough, distinguish between pregnancy rest and take-home baby rates. There's been a lot of nonsense in the United States where too many embryos have been implanted so that the specialist gets a very high pregnancy rate, not necessarily a high take-home baby rate. In Europe, you don't have so much of this problem. In the United States, we have had this problem. Potential complications that should arise need to be addressed. This is not a completely innocuous procedure. Innocuous risk, and I emphasize again, all dimensions of the financial cost that can be very, very expensive. Now, I emphasize, unlike the acute appendicitis example I gave, or acute fetal distress where you give directive counseling, this is a quintessential example of shared decision making. And you have to protect patients who may be vulnerable 
to making an incompletely informed decision and offer to schedule a visit to go over what the specialist has said so that the patient's questions are satisfied. When there are potential contraindications suggest a referral perhaps to a maternal fetal medicine specialist. When I hear these cases of the 62-year-old women or women with medical diseases, in the United States this has gotten out of hand. And referrals, I argue, must be made to a maternal fetal medicine patient so women know what the real risks are here. And if this is not done, I think this is an ethical problem. And I want to emphasize the last point, especially to this group. For women who are uncertain or hesitating, give permission not to seek further services. It is fine not to continue with IVF, not to have a child. I know this sounds like heresy to this group of reproductive medicine. Some women, it's better not to have a child. This, please, uh, uh, we have to give permission for some women not to go through with this. As Sonia introduced us to, there are other options. There's adoption. There's not having children. Um, uh, I, I think we need to be sensitive to women's needs and include this in our armamentarium. This is, I argue, a quintessential example of shared decision-making, and we need to be sensitive to women's needs in this area. And what's so important, the selection of the specialist should not be based on economic self-interest. This issue of self-referral, I mean, this is especially, especially dangerous. What Gregory and Percival introduced us to is so important, the patient comes first. And any hint of uh, churning uh, must be eschewed. Now, this issue of public trust is so important. This is a problem we face in America much, much more than Europe. There are, not so much in the academic centers, but in the private practice, it's loosely regulated in substates. There's bad IVF going on where pregnancy rates are reported, high level of embryos, and we have to police ourselves. I'm a firm believer in this there may be a role where we need to report these doctors to the Office of Professional Misconduct. Please, I see this in New York City, I'm ashamed to say, where there is, uh, of course, this doesn't happen in the state of Texas, I'm sure. But uh, let's be honest, IVF is a profit-making opportunity. Uh, here in the academic medical centers, we regulate it. But once you're out in the community where it's loosely regulated, uh, bad things happen, we have an obligation. And again, I refer to Gregory and Percival. We have to police ourselves. Otherwise, the lawyers and politicians are going to police this. There's so much more I could say, but I want to emphasize and wholly support what Sonia said. Ethics is an essential dimension of reproductive medicine, and I've tried to take the approaches a non-specialist in reproductive medicine. These are guiding principles for all of us who take care of patients. Thank you so much for the privilege of being with you.